Let me see what's going on there. I'm going to restart this again. And there we go. Well, first our children and grandchildren, and most of you probably realize that now, they've lost their attachment to place that many of us formed by playing outside. Computers and cell phone screens have usurped the attention of our eyes. Secondly, almost unnoticed, biological invasions and rapid human development has changed the wild areas we once played in. Ironically, while we argue the human immigration debate, we are steadily losing the plant and animal species that made North America unique. Some environmental organizations wait for friendly legislatures to act solutions, but government cannot save our natural history. Economic pressures coupled with continuing, continued population growth override the concern for uh, what some leaders call undeveloped habitats, we call it wild areas. In this presentation, we'll discuss the ideas I have listed there on the slide and consider a grassroots solution to the loss of our natural history. Extinction and at the local level, extirpation is a loss of species. Loss of species equals a drop in biodiversity, an important measurement to the ecological health of an area. The listed reasons there on the slide are given for this sixth great extinction the world is now experiencing also known as the Anthropocene, or in other words, man-made extinction. Sometimes it's hard for people in my part of the country to handle that many syllables. For our area and situation, we will address two of these probable causes, the ones underlined on the slide, that individual property owners can mitigate. In short, I'm asking, why do we mow so much grass while we lose our natural history? Well, to start with, what have we lost? Lucy Brown, Robert Gordon, Jane Forsyth, probably Daniel Boone, if he's sitting there, Greg Gardner, another great botanist that looked into the past to record what was here using uh, historical accounts. Anglo-European settlements brought fast and rapid change. From an 1883 history of Fairfield County, we get evidence of the speed of that change. Read and think about the red underlined portion of this document. It was written in 1883. Recently, Rick Gardner provided the following. 608 plants listed as rare in Ohio. Of these, 256 species are endangered, 158 threatened, and 84 presumed extirpated. Now, I say that realizing the last issue from the ODNR came out with some more recent plant change so those numbers have changed a little bit for the better, but still the overall picture has been a massive loss in native biodiversity. And just because some of these species are around, that doesn't mean they're around in great numbers. And we're not even talking about losses in animals or fungi. Well, this is what happened. This is behind where I lived before 2002, this photograph. We know that we've lost the large forest with some recovery in eastern Ohio counties. We also know we lost most of our wetlands and prairies. The rivals along, uh, the rival Europeans along with international trade brought exotic species from around the world. The last few years have brought rapid changes to agriculture and demographics as agriculture started to lose land to housing developments outside of cities and towns. That's the same fence row now. It is not the intent of the program, though, here to criticize agriculture, but only to find a solution to disappearing biodiversity that does not implicate or burden farmers. The spread of disease and introduced species is second only to habitat encroachment and fragmentation for the local disappearance of native species. Here's the remaining fence row. And most of you have been working hard in this area down where you're at. It's littered with dead and dying ash trees, coupled against olive olive with bush honey and vine honeysuckle occupying the strip. I like what the guy from Indiana said earlier about nothing native living anywhere. 
Well, a fellow Dr. Strauss from Boston College links these biological invasions to commuters and out of town housing developments. He argues that invasive species follow roadways and disturbance. But I think it's, there's a, a bigger reason than just that. As housing developments are established, homeowners add non-native species to the mowed landscapes, further impacting native biosystems. <laughs> I hope some of you. Uh, by the way, I, I probably run my own joke, but uh, with the exurban sprawl comes the invaders. For just a few examples, we have the cowbird up here in this corner, a nest parasite. Down here is Tabby the house cat, a non-native predator. Uh, most of you know the danger the emerald ash borer has presented and what it's done, removing almost the entire genera of ash trees from our landscapes. I don't have their picture, but we was talking earlier about flocks of starlings consuming everything in their path. The Japanese beetle has become a pest in both agricultural, natural, and home settings. These animals and others are well adapted to living within human modified landscapes. Pollinators and other uh, native insects are especially getting hard as native nectar and pollen producing plants disappear off the landscape. The one thing we can control though is, let me see if I can find my pointer again, the expansion of these three non-native species here. Ironically, it's the owner of the mowed lawn that can do the most immediate restoration of native species as agriculture is literally fenced in by economic concerns. Outside of natural areas of recovering forests, the homeowner has a tremendous blank slate of ground to work with in the form of the mowed lawn. It will boil down to what the property owner believes is important to the appearance of their homes and property. From that belief in the importance of natural history, do we value a well mowed and weed free lawn more than our natural history? It becomes, I think, a little hypocritical. We go on a natural area or park to view a butterfly or bird, but then we deny it habitat in our own backyard. This is an excerpt from a Scientific America article. You can see the date on the screen uh, that highlighted two problems, motivate, motivating homeowners to change their values and what to plant. What's ironic is this article was written by a person in Australia as they try to maintain well-watered lawns in an arid area. So these debates are spreading worldwide as fires, especially in Australia, and flooding affects our homes. So I asked, does the mowed lawn have to be the standard in property appearance? The homeowner will enjoy the option of how much and where based on family needs. Does the presence of uh, this pair of native plants have to be limited to nature preserves and parks? Could a series, and this is my pipe dream, could a series of backyard nature preserves linked along the edge agricultural fields and within neighborhoods become a partial solution to disappearing biodiversity and provide additional space for the survival of various species hemmed in by park and preserve values of uh, boundaries? Now, I don't mean official nature preserves. I'm just calling them tongue in cheek when we do this. Well, these are some issues and arguments that could stand in the way of the homeowners naturalizing the backyards. And we'll revisit this slide again at the end because I think it forms a basis for some questions. Major advantages to the backyard nature preserve include a sense of ownership. The property owner will feel responsibility and pride for the area they're restoring. And I by no means uh, mean to criticize government. I'm just saying that when we've got, let's say 1400 acres and a conservation worker in one, one particular site and we can get down there with a the conservation worker once a week or have a few volunteer days, maybe once or twice a month, sometimes you just don't feel like you're winning the war. If we can adopt a belief system that gives us the social permission to naturalize our yards, the next step is determining what to grow. 
And by the way, this is my backyard part of it. Since 1492, we have moved European and Asian plant and animal species across the oceans and we've reshaped both our developed and wild areas along with the remnant natural communities we have left. The majority of picnickers, hikers, runners, cyclists, and disc golfers, they don't have the knowledge you folks have. These folks visit our parks and preserves today. They really don't know the difference between native and non-native species because I think as a group of people, a generation, we've lost our collective knowledge of North American natural history. So we have to start with relearning what species were here originally. This is a sign in a nature preserve uh, in Illinois I visited a couple years ago, pre-COVID, if, if I remember back that far. Plants native to a region have adapted to the whims and fancies, the, the amount of water, the type of seasons, the climate. So how do we find out what is native to this area? And that was one of the first projects I had to take on. Well, to start with, visiting nature preserves near your home will provide answers to the native plants that grow in your area. And again, you folks have an advantage over presenting, and you would have my blessing if you do this, presenting programs in you, to your area to interested uh, homeowners that would be interested in buying into this. And you folks already have that advantage of knowing some of these plants and what they look like, or probably a lot of them, probably all of them. So we have references that can be used, I'm pointing to some of them, that help uh, provide information on local species. Once we determine uh, what to grow, you can get lucky, and this was a good book here, but of course it didn't have all species, that can provide growing guidance. The pollination concern here and here has been uh, opening up new avenues of approach to this thing. And some of these books on bees and pollinators have been putting a lot of plant species in there. But the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and this is the maiden website right here in the middle, uh, they have a website called Go Native and I don't know if you can see that right up here in the bar, but it's Ohio DNR uh, dash gov backslash go native. And they have downloadable PDF folders uh, for different physiographic regions of the country, different areas of the country with lists of woody shrubs and herbaceous species that grow in your area. One, if you can find it, this reference right here, when I was doing uh, some graduate work, I was able to undercome, over, uncover this one. This was by a uh, Charles Gordon, I believe that's his name. And he wrote a book back in 1966 for the Ohio Biological Survey called The Natural Vegetation of Ohio in Pioneer Days. He concentrates mostly on forests, but he did have quite a bit of information on, on uh, herbaceous plants that grow, you know, either in what prairie openings there were in the forest. So once you figure out what you want to plant, the next question is where to get them. So just a quick search of, uh, and this, I just did a search on vendors. And actually, I don't want to hold this too close because I don't want to get in trouble proposing one vendor over another, but I've actually, these are examples of seed packets received from these vendors that we use to begin the process back in our yard. And by the way, I keep the seed packets because sometimes I can't remember where I put stuff and what it was. So beyond the color of green, small strips across our yard became the first areas, uh, the first targets to naturalize. We had quite a few ash trees. We had 15 ash trees in our yard. So the death and removal of the ash trees opened up areas that simply meant either more mowing or living with noxious weeds. The left photo, uh, let me see if I can get my mouse over here is along our property line on the south side. The poison hemlocks, daylilies, candid thistle, goldenrod, and smooth brown that were there originally that formed what would have been a mode, uh, a uh, boundary area 
what well, used to be a fence row with trees and stuff, of course they were all gone. I did use sprays to kill that at first, especially with, there was Canada thistle in there. So once we got that killed, we started replanting both with seedlings and plants that we started in a greenhouse. We have a small greenhouse first. So one question I kept asking myself, in addition to what, only, what not only grew in this area prior to settlement, but what does well on former, former agricultural or yard lawn soils? The other question, and this is probably one of the most important ones, is how much can I manage? So we've expanded a couple feet at a time over a few years, and we've already been adding native shrubs. The right side over here, for example, is a couple feet along an ornamental fence that I used to have to weed whip all the time. Now I don't worry about it. I just went out a couple feet and this area stays wet. So we put in some wet plants and other wildflowers took off there. The biggest problem with how much you can manage has been the continued weeding of the non-native plants, just like any other garden, just like where we raise our lettuce and the beans and potatoes. You have to get in there and the chickweed and purple dead nettle and creeping charlie are going to find these places and they're going to be right in there. At times it can be relaxing as long as we don't overwhelm ourselves. One other challenge I learned, uh, not being a Daniel Boone or an Andrew or a Rick, uh, is recognizing when seedlings come up, are these going to be good guys or are these going to be bad guys? So that's kind of a learning process as you go along. As we increased our native beds, we had an increase in native pollinators to our fruit trees and vegetable plants. So that works hand in hand. Some of you might have guessed I kind of grew up in the hills a little bit. So I did grow up with ginseng and other native woodland plants, and I found an advantage to having a shaded north sections from our homes and our outbuildings and amending the soil, we could have beds of plants that reminded me of Kentucky and Ohio hillsides. We did, we aren't neglecting the shrub layer and it's taken as we talked about earlier for the meeting, it's taken a beating from invasions by bush honeysuckle. Uh, you start to get down here in the Hocking Hills, we find Japanese barberry, of course, small floor rose has been around for a while, vine honeysuckle has been around, non-native burning bush, and of course, winter creeper. And I'm sure there's more, buckthorn and everything else. So, but the thing to remember here is our native shrubs, and we discussed this a little bit earlier for the meeting, furnish important blooms for pollinators, and later, important fruits for birds. I like to talk about that in programs as calling the front end and the back end effect. And I'm forgetting about the middle where a lot of our native butterflies and moths are chewing on the leaves of these things. We, uh, here we have a spice bush down here blooming early in the spring. Uh, I think one of your listeners was telling me earlier, he has quite a bit of spice bush and those are high value fruits for birds. Uh, native burning bush right up here. I've been finding the hard thing with them is trying to keep a deer off of them. They'll, they really get into uh, rubbing them pretty hard during the rut. Uh, gray dogwood later in the spring and I find these dogwood flowers, the gray, the silky, the red osier, and I don't think I have rough leaf or anything. I, they're almost like a carpet of flowers. You can see this little bee here and I, I'm afraid to say where it could be an adrenaline or not. Uh, they just walk over these flowers like a carpet. And then finally in the wet areas of our yards, uh, blooming a little bit later in the year is button bush. And that, that seems to be a popular plant with the pollinators. I'm assuming your group, because your wildflower group has a few photographers. Well, renaturalizing, it gives you the opportunity to see some of nature's most dramatic and colorful moments right in your own backyard, providing both milkweeds for caterpillars and then high value plants like Blazing Star has increased the amount of monarchs and other butterflies we have hanging around our place. Bumblebees are a really good and underappreciated pollinator, especially for vine crops and our tomatoes. We try to 
and here's a secret I think that we don't try to keep in mind, especially when we look at the fields of goldenrods and fall and people think, oh, well, that's great for the bees. My question is, what did the bees eat before the, the goldenrod started to bloom? So it's important to try to maintain a variety of blooming plants that will bloom through the year. As I mentioned earlier, we have wet places in our yard that are hard to mow. They became, and this became one of my favorite milkweeds too. I can start them in seed over here, the swamp milkweed in the spring and have them blooming by July or August. Now they don't last as long as common and they don't seem to hang around as many years as a perennial, but uh, well, you can tell here we, the monarch caterpillars really do well on them. So we took those wet areas in the yard and instead of, you know, in probably March, April, May, we push mow because I've always uh, kind of been sort of a fitness nut. And since I got uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I can't exactly do the running and stuff anymore, but I will push a mower. It takes me about four hours or so to mow the lawn and I do it for exercise. But in these areas that remained wet through the first part of spring, all I did was, and you've probably done this, you push your mower and your mower sinks in about an inch in the grass and the mud. And I finally decided, why am I mowing these areas? It's crazy. So we put them, we, we start cutting areas out um, and we start putting wetland adapted species in such as swamp milkweed, obedient plant and native grasses such as riverbank rye and so on, and sedges, fox sedges. And, uh, the, the most invasive weed in these areas right here, but it is a native plant has been the nut sedge. Uh, coming over here is a picture I had it earlier. I just wanted to bring it back. The rattlesnake master is relatively rare native plant. Maybe not so way down, maybe not as much down in Adams County and places, but up here, in Pickaway County, outside of Stages Pond, you'd probably be you'd hard put to find any surviving anywhere off the nature preserve. But I found surprisingly, them showy goldenrod, and we just got um, loyal catchfly this year started. Do very well when put in the right place and freed from Eurasian species competition. So there's a couple, couple weeds I figured you got to keep out of there. And one of them, unfortunately, is Canada goldenrod and smooth rod. The trick is ensure, though, that these rare species were in your area before you add them. Because I noticed that some of the vendors are selling prairie plants that were necessarily not native to Ohio. And we've probably done enough of that moving around stuff. Now, the appearance of the naturalized beds after fall could present a problem for some property owners. I'm lucky I kind of live in one of them exurbanized strips along a major county road where uh, our house was actually an older home. It was moved to an area that was a cornfield when this house was built new. Well, we bought it. It's presented its problems, but the bottom line is we're on former cornfield. So that means that area was taken out of production and then put into the yard. So I don't have probably the neighbor problems that people that live right in a city do. Okay, so what about the dried stems? And some of you may already know this, but the cone and sunflowers, they look unsightly, but they do provide homes, especially some bees have laid their eggs, bored into these stems and other insects and laid their eggs there. What we do is, because again, I'm a little bit free of homeowner association regulation or anything like that, we wait till later in the spring before cutting and chipping these stems back into the beds. I want to kind of give uh, maybe around the 1st of May, when green stuff is starting to come up around them before we really actually take them down. And I use a small chipper just to shred the mulch right back on the bed so we feed the ground. Now within local fire regulations, an occasional, and if you live in an area where you can get the permission to do it, fall or winter burn may be appropriate, not every year, but every so many years. And again, that depends on your local situation. This was our South 
bed in early spring a couple of years ago showing a mixture of native plants and shrubs and even uh, ferns and bringing home what belongs here. I wanted to put that in because I was talking about expanding a couple weeks. This is a view of the same bed from the opposite direction and you could see a curve right around here. This is when I feel like I had all this back through here under control enough and we have two or three other beds that are not photographed. Under control enough I could start pushing another area out. So a substantial portion of our property stays wet with rapid grass growth. And I talked about why it's such a pain to try to push a mower through ground that holds about an inch of water right on top. So we found that wetland obligate and facultative plants are, do well here. This, uh, we have senna and this is swamp hibiscus. And I have some volunteer sunflowers. I just let them go because the uh, goldfinches seem to find them. And I hate to take them away from the. So this, this area right here behind this green building just about holds water all year round. Yet we found things that like to grow there. I'm getting pretty close to the end. This is two views of the last one we put in. This was a 20 by 60 area. I took a photo from uh, two different aspects. These were seed mixes. Um, I'll read you what they were. Mesic short grass seed packet, wet wildflower seed packet, and moist metal seed packet. This was the area, a lot of this area is our leach bed, which is pretty high to the ground, or pretty close to the surface of the soil. So this area stayed again extremely wet and tough to mow. It was seeded with the mixes I just talked. This is one year ago I seeded that, and this was the pictures this fall. So the grasses are wetland rise and sedges. The pinks are swamp milkweed. You can see them back over there with black eyed Susans. And the red is cardinal flower, which is really pleasant surprise that it jumped up and got going that fast. The reduced mowing alone was worth the cost of the seed mixes. So when it, I think it boils down. Oh, well, I wanted to make one other comment too. I had my notes. So we have a pond, I think I sent that photo out earlier and I really didn't other than the opening slide and it's, we expanded it. We did that, we had a really low spot. I just dug it out a little bit, lined a portion of it and then cut all of our house drains and the tiles and our, our buildings, outbuildings all into this area. And it's, this project's been going on five years now. We actually don't have any reed canary grass. I've actually got native uh, cut grasses and glycerin and stuff like that. Um, the native uh, sedges, the cypress that comes there and uh, we've got, uh, we actually have calamus in there and, and blue flags. But the main thing I wanted to get at here is each year that pond spawns an incredible amount of frogs and an incredible amount of dragonflies. We really don't have a mosquito problem with it because we have enough dragonflies and damp supplies to take care of the problem. So the wife and I can actually sit outside on, in the summer without getting ate alive. But the other thing this area did was, I don't know how many of you might've noticed this, but you get the, the leopard frogs come into wet high grass and start foraging. And occasionally my mower would find them, usually with rather dramatic results. So by putting this, setting this ground aside and not mowing it, has given these frogs and toads and a hopefully one day salamanders, you know, uh, lung salamanders, a, chan a place to go to in the yard free from a mower's whirring blade right over their head. So it really comes down, and this is where I'd like to open it up for discussion to answer these questions. And I'm all ears for anybody who wants to yell at me or scream at me for what I'm doing or uh, has questions on our little journey through this, through trying to reestablish native plants back in our yards. I'm sorry, I'm not getting much audio. <laughs> 
Thanks. Well, I, I, this is Bob Bergstein. I, I'll put my picture back on if I can figure out how to do that. Do you do you find I, I, where where do you live now? Well, we live between Circleville and Lancaster. We're on glacial till. Okay. Um, really deep glacial till. In other words, it's clay, and it was farmed, so it's really clay. So uh, these areas were garden for a while, and then of course growing up in weeds. So we have had a bit of trouble with that if you're going on soil conditions. I, I guess the question the, the question I might ask is how do your 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 adjacent neighbors feel about this or do you have you do they have they joined you in desiring to plant native plants or or either in Ohio or else in Kentucky Eastern Kentucky where you grew up do you have any feeling about how people feel about it? Well, to be it? honest, my neighbors both uh, they're I'm I'm a, I'm lucky that they they don't live real close. My neighbor to the east is about. 100 yards away and a field does split us. It was in soybeans last year, what well, made it through the rain. He runs a zero turn mower around a big yard, probably about four acres. The neighbor to the west is a young farmer, but he, he has expressed some interest in what I'm doing. He stopped by and look at things, but his wife had come to some of my programs in the past. So, you know, that was that end. What I did find really interesting was the farmer that farms the ground that's adjacent to mine. He actually, his wife also attended a program at Schallenberger a few years ago. She's a local librarian, so she now knows what I'm about. Well, this guy, he got off his tractor one day and was worried about some of these plants spreading seeds. And I challenged him on a question. And, and, he couldn't, you know, he, he understood what I was getting at. And the question was, where have you seen these plants at as weeds in your field? Now think about that. How many fields do you go by that you're going to see a coneflower as a weed, a, you know, a, a rattlesnake master popping up as a weed in somebody's field? So once he's seen that, he was okay with everything. But as far as affecting other people doing this, you are actually, I talked to the OCVN group here in Hocking County, very similar to this, a year ago. And so, so far I've only preached to the choir. That makes sense? It, yes, it, to me it does. Yes, it does. I, I would think that they would be, uh, certainly you're right that the non that the, the, the main weeds are non-native plants. So the native plants are not going to really infest their fields as far as I know. So that's, that's a, a good point to make to your neighbors. Now, there is one plant that uh, I've been having to keep under control. The green-headed coneflower really loves my soil. Mm -hmm. So that booger, I've been having to start keeping it under control. Uh, another another uh, hint, do you guys get the evening primrose down that way? Yeah. If, it's a native plant, but it, it actually still does well, even in agricultural situations. And it tended to be a problem in my bed, so I got tough on it till I realized it healed the Japanese beetles. You know, each year about June, I, and I'll get them next year really bad, because it seems like especially where a wheat crop comes off, you get a lot of Japanese beetles. So anyhow, they tend to go right straight to the evening primrose and eat it down. And at least it sequesters them till they get through their life cycle. For whatever, if everybody's interested in doing this, if you start getting a lot of evening primrose, don't pull them all out till you get past uh, Japanese beetle time. <laughs> I learned that one just this past year. I'm sorry, I. I mean, I have other, I have other questions, but I'm sure other people have other questions. So why don't people, other people have questions? I know Stan Lockwood is here, and he has planted native plants in his yard. He may have some com comments about this. Nancy Lins, I see, is on here, and she's involved with a project with Hope Taft about sort of nationalizing this concept of having everybody have a natural plant garden and. and um, in their yards in America, I would say, and and you know, uh, documenting this. So, do they have any questions or comments? 
Yeah, this is Nancy. If, if I could, um, about a year ago, we launched our website for Ohio Native Plant Month. And I um, started off by putting out a query across Ohio to a whole bunch of serious gardener friends. And I said, when you want to buy native plants, where do you go to buy them? And they wrote back to me. And I had compiled that list. And it consists of about 90 spots in Ohio that sell native plants where you can buy them. So if you go to Ohio Native Plant Month, www.ohionativeplantmonth.org, you can get on our website, but if you go to that page, you can download that spreadsheet, sort it by zip code, and that will give you people who grow native plants in your area of Ohio. Thank you. That, I'll probably look at that myself, because from where I live, I pretty much have, if I want to find something new that's already growing, I pretty much have to drive to Athens. Yeah, I understand.